Thank you for being here again this evening for session two. I'm Georgette Howington, Contra Costa and Alameda County's coordinator. For those of you who live in Contra Costa County and Alameda counties, I'm going to put my personal email down at the bottom. Uh, I mean, on the, in the chat tonight uh, so that you can contact me uh, when you have some time because I do have some ideas for uh, trails and I can work with you hands on. Everybody else, I can also do personal coaching, um, but since, I, since I'm the Contra Costa County and Alameda County coordinator, um, you know, I can work with my, you know, my local people uh, hands on. Um, I'd like to thank um, Carolyn Knight for hosting um, this, this uh, Zoom this evening. Dick Blaine, our program director, is with us again. And uh, please write your questions into the chat room. I'll do my best to answer as we go, and we'll answer the tough ones at the end. Please stay muted and turn off your camera. Um, so I'd like to turn this over now to Mike Azevedo, who is the Santa Clara County um, coordinator. And we may go over an hour, OK? So I hope you can hang in there with us. Um, if for some reason you can't and you have to leave right at one hour if we run over, please contact me if you uh, would like some personal coaching. And also uh, know that um, we uh, are going to have resources at the end. So I hope you can hang in there because these resources are going to be very valuable. And you can uh, read this whole course in more detail on our website, www.cbrp.org. So uh, Mike, I'll introduce you again to Mike. And so Mike, take it away. You mentioned questions, right? If they have questions, what to do? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. cool. And put them in chat. And then yeah. uh, keep I know you said keep right. yourself muted. Cool. Yeah. All on. right. So um, why do you mon monitor a nest box? And how often should you monitor? Let's start there. Um, so we monitor about once a week during the nesting season. That season starts as early as February and lasts as late as August. How early nests appear in your neighborhood really varies and you will eventually come out, come to figure out when you can really expect to see nests in your neighborhood because you know microclimates and things like that. Um, all these things, it depends on where you are. So uh, answering the question of why you monitor, one good, a good answer is predation. You can't babysit these birds. Often the best you can do is to respond when it happens. I'll talk ab ab about more, uh, more about that later on when we discuss challenges, but helping a nest full of young birds through an attack or sadly just trying to prevent the next attack, that is likely to come maybe all you can do. And knowing that something just happened to the occupants of the nest is actually the first step Weekly monitoring is the key. So I talked about house sparrows. There, this is another reason uh, to monitor every week. I'll, uh, I'll discuss what to do when you find them in challenges, but you need to be watching so you can deal with the problem before it gets worse. What you see here is two nests, one built on top of another. We don't want this. So you will hopefully show up each week and on schedule you'll find an empty nest um, well, on skids and notice. What I mean is that uh, one of these, you know, you're coming along, you find, uh, you should know where in the nesting, uh, the nesting uh, cycle you are. And sooner or later, you're gonna find an empty nest because the, uh, the birds fledged, right? And so uh, hopefully it's on schedule because finding an empty nest at the wrong time is a bad sign, but Either way, keep in mind that these birds are expert nest builders. Get rid of that old poopy nest and let them build a clean, fresh nest. One reason is that the old nests may have parasite eggs or blowfly eggs or something like that. Reason number two is that the second nest in the box will be on top of the first. That makes the nest taller and the cup closer to the entrance, which means that those babies are closer to the door. 
And closer to the door is an invitation to predators who want to reach in and grab a snack. The, pred the predator guards are supposed to keep the babies farther away from trouble, but here a taller nest defeats that purpose. My daughter here is petting a horse that lives right next to the nest box. That illustrates a little problem issue, horse hair. Horse hair is well known to get used, used in nest boxes and it could get wrapped around baby's legs. Many a chick has been found hanging on horse hair. Check your box weekly and you may have an opportunity to save the chick before they die from this or other problems you can't prevent ahead of time. And by the way, I'm not trying to pick on horses here. The point I was trying to make is that you may find some kind of a hazard that has happened and you want to be there when you come every week, you might be able to stumble into the, the circumstances when you can actually help the babies survive something that they otherwise would have died from. And now, and then stuff falls apart, wood cracks, things fall off. You're a landlord and you don't have to plunge toilets. This is the easiest landlord, landlord job out there. So we asked you to monitor weekly and now you will find out why it can be so useful. It's a little something I like to call bluebird math. The numbers just work very well. See, it takes about a day to lay an egg. While laying eggs, the parents don't sit on the eggs. They will sit on them all at once, once they need to start incubating. Because incubation starts at the same time, they all basically hatch at once. Now, let's say you check on Monday and you find two eggs. The next week on Monday, you find five. That means things are working just as this calendar shows up here. Brooding starts on Friday, so incubation begins. They may lay two eggs or they may lay six. It all depends on how confident the birds are of what insect populations will look like in a month. Hunting is gonna be easier if you only have to feed two mouths, if you only have two out mouths to feed. Of course, I started the egg laying uh, on Sunday on this calendar and it could happen any day of the week. The key to the rest of it is just when the brooding begins. And once brooding begins, uh, drop down two weeks to see when the hatching should occur. And by the way, bluebirds follow this schedule and it does vary from species to species, but for cavity nesting songbirds, it is close enough to this system that it should work very well to tell you where in the cycle you are, no matter what species you're dealing with. Then they all hatch, and if you drop down two more weeks, that's when we get to the near-fledging age. And then you get to those last four days. Now, I love how this works because you can just drop down two weeks for incubating, drop down two more weeks for those last four days, and then you will know when it is time to watch for pre-fledging. So what is pre-fledging? Well, those last few days, the birds are practicing their flying skills and they are getting ready to fledge. In theory, when you open the box and the chicks are that old, they may panic and try and fledge. Problem is they may not be ready. If this is the case, they'll flop all over the ground and you will have to run around trying to catch them and stick them back to, into the box. To the, avoid this, you could just keep track of where in the cycle the birds are. And when you get to that age, those last four days, Handle it like this. Those older chicks need to be fed every 10 minutes. The parents are working overtime. Just hang back and watch to see if the parents return with food. It should happen shortly. You may even hear the chicks calling out. All you need to know is that there are chicks in the box. Make a note of it and move on. Let's talk about the technique used to check the nest boxes. First of all, when you check, Make sure it is not cold or windy outside. Uh, try, try and do it right around the middle of the day when things are the most comfortable. That will certainly make the young uncomfortable if you open during when it's really uncomfortable outside. You are better off waiting until the time of day when the atmosphere outside is the most comfortable for the babies. And then by knocking ahead of time, um, ahead of opening the nest box, you give any parents the opportunity to exit the box before you open it up. They won't always take advantage of it, but it is nice to give them the opportunity. Uh, we advocate a no touch policy. That doesn't mean you can't touch them if there's a solid reason to. For example, if a baby is stuck on horse hair, you could pick up the baby and remove the hair. 
On the other hand, just picking up the babies uh, when uh, just picking up the babies is unnecessary most of the time. If you don't need to, just leave them alone. The bird above, for example, is brooding on eggs. Chances are the next time you show up, the mama will be gone and you can count the eggs. You can just write down that the female bluebird is brooding. If she's there the next time, you can wait yet another week. If you have to actually count beaks, the count the babies, you can do that. That's why you count beaks, count, count little stomachs, whatever you end up counting. Normally I figure I have a good count of eggs. I don't need to count babies. They're always laying all over each other and it is kind of hard to get an accurate count anyway. But if you have to, then, then that's one thing you can do. Here's a screen that Georgette uses for monitoring. As she opens her nest box, she slips this screen up under the door and is able to block anything from falling out. It is easy to make with wire cloth, duct tape, and a carabiner. And how you collect your data is up to you. I've been known to write it down on scratch paper and transfer it to a spreadsheet seen above. There are forms available on our website that you can also print out and take with you. Things to note on my sheet you see here, and this is a, an actual spreadsheet from a year, a few years ago, um, where it says T-R-E-S-B-R, that was a tree swallow nest. The four letter abbreviation, I noted that the bird was brooding. You notice I wrote T-R-E-S-Y, which means just young present. I don't get numbers unless I didn't get a good count of the eggs. When I find an empty nest, and it makes sense that it is empty based on the nesting cycles, I just figure they fledged. I should have a number of eggs. When I find that empty nest, it may have bad eggs in it, eggs that never hatched. It may have dead young birds. This is natural, unfortunately. What I do, subtract, uh, what I do is subtract bad eggs and dead babies from the number of eggs that I had previously counted. Notice the black entry. I had a nest with tree, swa uh, tree swallow eggs. The next week, the mother was brooding. This meant that more eggs could have been laid and I just didn't know. So I knew I needed to count beaks when I came back. I did and I counted five chicks. Unfortunately, the nest was completely empty when I came back the next week. A snake had predated the baby birds. I knew that those birds should have been there based on the cycles. So let's talk about nest box monitor tools, the things you want gonna wanna bring with you. So here's a two compartment bag that Georgette uses for nest box monitoring. A day pack, tool belt, or fishing vest can also be used to carry your tools. Um, and uh, here, uh, and uh, here are some safety items that you can bring to make your nest box monitoring a little safer. Uh, a comfortable hat cell phone with GPS app, a walking stick, water, first aid kit, insect repellent, snack, and compass. Now, of course, you know, cell phones have compass things on them too, but, you know, um, it was on the list, so I just thought I'd say it. Um, and then these may come in handy. That's Tom, uh, Tom Gary's famous expression. Um, a cell phone to record data data forms or notebook with pen. So you can, uh, what I sometimes do is I actually will uh, like you make a little video and I'll just walk along and I'll tell the video on my cell phone what I found in the last three boxes. And then when I get home, I'll just play all the videos back and I'll just put it all up on that spreadsheet I showed you. Or I could put it on, um, on scrap paper or you can use a form. And we have forms available on our website that, you know, have, that you know how it tells you everything you need to collect. So if you're uh, if you're nervous and you're afraid you're going to forget something, you can use our forms. Uh, and here's the uh, the one of the forms that we actually have on the website. You can print it out and take it with you. Um, and then uh, remember that screen I was telling you about. Now it's easy to make these. You just use a uh, wire, the wire mesh, and uh, duct tape and a carabiner. And um, we're going to talk about hanging nest boxes. So obviously, if you have hanging nest boxes, you're going to need a uh, your retriever, the, the 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 lifter, the thing that pulls the nest boxes out of the tree. Um, and we'll talk more about that later. Um, and screwdrivers. Now, uh, the even if you have 
just uh, Phillips head screwdrivers that you need in order to deal with the screws. Actually, the slotted screwdriver comes in handy sometimes because uh, things don't, they're, they're all swollen and it's nice to be able to get in there and pry things open. And um, also notice the putty knife or paint scraper um, can be uh, very helpful in empty, getting all that um, old debris out of the nest box because you don't want to touch it with your hand or anything like that. Um, and then needle nose pliers, standard pliers. Pliers are always really helpful, especially um, with those uh, little twisty um, uh, type entry holes because they get the, the box gets swollen and then those things are a lot harder to pull to open up than you think they are. Being able to use pliers to open those up are very helpful. Um, and then stiff brush for cleaning. And you can imagine uh, dried poop is real fun to get off the inside of the nest box. Um, dental or mechanics mirror to look at the eggs and nestlings. And this is because a lot of times the, um, these boxes are a little bit higher than it's comfortable. I mean, maybe somebody else put it up and you're shorter than the person who put it up. So um, it's nice to have a little mirror that you can kind of hold up and look inside to see what is in, how many eggs are in there or what kind of nestlings. And um, the, now this is a little dental mirror, but they actually have mechanics mirrors that are actually bigger. So, um, okay, and then scarf or cloth. And the way that Georgette uses these is, remember she has that screen? And if she, she's looking at the, 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 uh, the cycles and she's thinking, well, I don't know. I'm, uh, it, maybe these uh, eggs, these chicks are, uh, are really old. And so what she does is she'll put the screen up and she'll block the hole with the cloth. And that way she knows that nothing's going to come jumping out. Um, and then gloves, leather, rubber. Remember that you're going to be um, dealing with powdery poop here. So um, it's always nice to be able to have something so you don't have to touch that stuff with your fingers. Um, and then uh, dust mask. Now this is all, even before COVID, you, you want to bring a dust mask because uh, this, this powder that comes out when you're brushing out the old nest, it's nothing you want to breathe in. You know, I'm lucky because it seems like every time I pull them out, the wind carries it and just this big cloud of powder goes um, running off with the wind. And so um, but, you know, it's good to have a mask so you know you're not going to read any of this stuff in. Um, and then also consider bringing uh, diatomaceous earth. Now, diatomaceous earth is a tool to combat ants. Though it looks like powder, it actually has the consistency of broken glass as far as the ants are concerned. Use it carefully. Don't use it where it could come in contact with the babies because it can irritate their skin. And, and by the way, I should point out that fire ants are really bad news for, for chicks, but um, even the little Argentine ants are not gonna be comfortable. You know, I've, I've found different situations. Sometimes I'll find a lot of ants all over dead babies and I won't know whether the ants found the babies already dead or if the ants actually did it. I suspect that the ants just found um, the dead babies and they died from something else, but um, anyway, uh, diatomaceous earth is, is a uh, one tool to use against the ants. And another one is something called tangle foot. Uh, now this is actually tangle, a tangle trap sticky coating that, uh, that, uh, we were turned on by, uh, by, uh, Lee Pauser. Now diatomaceous earth may have the advantage over, uh, this other fighting tool called tangle foot. Um, the, the actual tangle foot has the consistency of grease. So you literally put it around uh, poles or things like that that the ants are using as their little pathway. And then, um, and then it's supposed to stop the ants. Uh, the problem is if you get that grease, you can get that grease on you. You can get it on the bird feathers. You can get it on you know anything that, that is, comes in contact with it. And it's not good. I mean, you can imagine what it's like for a bird to get grease on their feathers. So you got to be so careful with Tanglefoot. Now, this product here is actually called Tangle Trap, and uh, Lee likes it better than Tanglefoot, which is kind of a low bar. Um, the product shown above is a bit better than Tanglefoot. Um, you could put it on the pole to prevent ants from crossing it. 
but you need to avoid the possibility of getting it inadvertently on birds. Get tanglefoot on feathers and you will regret it. Um, so this is what Lee said. I prefer this can of it because it includes a brush. Care must be taken to avoid applying it where the bird might come in contact with it. So I apply a band of it completely around the wire. Now he's talking about hanging nest boxes and remember they're holding onto the, the branch of the wire. Um, just below the hanger, uh, the wire's hook. The band could be one half to one inch wide. If it becomes less effective as the surface hardens or enough ants get stuck in it to form a bridge. It may need to be refreshed the next week. One also needs to be careful not to contact it yourself when handling the boxes it is hard to clean off. And then uh, screws often come in handy. Sometimes you need to find a longer screw to replace one that just isn't holding the box closed anymore. Or the next nest box is loose and needs to be tightened up. And plastic bags, big or small, often become useful when something needs to be held onto for some reason. Small plastic containers can be used to hold onto grass that could be used to reconstruct nests that get wet or for some reason just don't work. And Tom and uh, you will no doubt collect uh, other items for your trail, uh, like hammers, stakes, wire, extra nest boxes. These are all essentials that you get to get you started. So a lot of people start off with the idea of putting a nest box in their yard. That may work and it may not. It usually takes at least an acre of grassland to make good hunting grounds for a Western bluebird nest. And more if we were talking about a mountain bluebird family. Your lawn might get hunted by bluebirds, but it might take more territory to really do it. A schoolyard across the fence, for example, would absolutely provide a good source of food. It is just a matter of how much food is available. If you see bluebirds in your yard, by all means, put up a bluebird house. If you see them nearby, put up a bluebird house. If you never see them, or you can tell that there isn't a native plant within a quarter mile of your house, maybe your backyard isn't the best place for a nest box. But then again, there are black backyards that have no bluebirds, but they do have other cavity nesting birds uh, native hoping for your assistance. If you think this might be you, just let us know. We'll, let, we'll help you figure out what's going on. Native plants are the key to success in a backyard nest. Not just what is in your yard, but what is nearby. But let's say you, have, uh, you live in an apartment or you know your backyard is not a good place for a nest box. Look at the park nearby or other open space. You can set up a nest box trail there. A nest box trail is a string or strings of nest boxes. I have a nest box trail in a county park with three lines of nest boxes, including bluebird boxes, chickadee boxes, barn owl boxes, and American kestrel boxes. Don't just put the nest box up on public property. You need to get permission. The way you do this is to find out who controls it, who controls the land, and go to ask them um, they are actually kind of used to people making requests like this. They'll have questions for you, and we can actually help you through the process. And by the way, county parks, city parks, and even utility districts have volunteer groups. Joining volunteer groups like this may make the job of setting up a nest box trail on land controlled by that agency easier. One question that they often have is what kind of birds might nest in your nest box? Now, I've made a big deal about the fact that the birds need to be in your neighborhood to nest in your box. How could you possibly know that? Well, here's one. eBird is an app and net website that allows you to find birds that birders have found in your neighborhood. It is popular and getting better and better known and used. You can see what cavity nesting birds are common near your house. And if you are looking at a park or other open space, the birds may well be there uh, will be birding, the birders may be well be birding there. Um, when you set up a nest box trail, know what species to expect and install boxes that use the preferences we know that each target species prefers. And if you have any questions about where, what might be in your particular area, make sure and ask us about it. So in summary, when you are setting up a nest box trail, consider the habitat, the canopy, 
tree species, birds seen in the area, pesticides, human activity, construction, uh, purchase for hunting. Now, when I say purchase for hunting, I don't mean put a perch, a perch on the nest box. I mean, places where the birds can actually stand and look to see what's going on down there. Um, for example, they, they like sitting on fences, but the, there's no perches anywhere in a big grassy area. Maybe you can put up a little pole or something like that that they can use to sit on while they're looking around to see what, what's out there. Um, also, uh, safety, uh, the safe entry, and safe entry for parents. So um, there are a few ways to mount your nest box. Let's go over them and discuss the pros and cons of each. So uh, pole mounted nest boxes are probably the preferred me method of mounting your nest box if it is available to you and it isn't always. Installation can involve quite a process such as using an auger like this one. Those can dig a good hole, a pole hole pretty fast, but remember to check with the utilities to be sure you're not gonna hit a gas line or something. Or you could just start by using a shovel or a post hole digger. And you, can, and you may not even need that if the ground is soft enough. These fence post drivers are a good way to drive the pole into the ground. If the ground is soft enough, you probably won't even need to start with an auger or a shovel. Look at the conduit clamp um, in the middle of this pole. This is a good way to secure the box to the pole. U-bolts can also do the job. Notice that the conduit clamp is screwed into the floor. And notice that our nest box monitor, Tom, Tim McClintock here, is drilling into the pole and through the wood so he can put a bolt through that can hold the box to the pole in one place. You can also drill um, through the clamp to the pole and the pole here is actually an electrical conduit. Uh, there are a number of ways to attach uh, the box to the pole. Some of Tim's boxes have track rails. Uh, and track rails have parts that allow the box to be clamped to the pole. So um, now th there's all different kinds of ways to attach the pole to the box. This, this is th literally three different ways. I've talked about U-bolts and the conduit clamps. And here you've got uh, these uh, track rails. Um, so the, the pros of using a pole is that they are easy to put in and move. Now, I should say they're easy to put in wherever you want to put them. Um, there are other uh, types of mounting that are even easier to move around. Um, pulling the pole out, you can do it. Uh, it, it may not be easy to do it all year round. I mean, you can, you can certainly um, kind of put, move it back and forth during the winter um, when the ground is soft and move it elsewhere. So that's what I mean by you can move it around. And when you're actually going to install it, you can pretty much put it wherever you want. You want it 20 feet away from that tree, you can put it 20 feet away from that tree. Um, and uh, they're compatible with the stovepipe baffle and the knoll guard. And... Um, the, the stovepipe baffle, they're only usable with a pole. Um, compatible with, uh, and so they're not as vulnerable to predators as many of the other types of mounting uh, uh, systems. And then uh, they are the safest across the nation, the safest form of mounting a nest box across the nation. Now the, the hanging nest boxes are actually very safe here in California. But you can't say that in Louisiana because they have, uh, they have tree climbing snakes. So the cons, they're not always an option. For example, in my park, my county park, um, if I wanted to put in a pole like this, I'd have to go through a, a whole CEQA uh, process that takes a long time. I'd have to get approval. It's considered development. So you can't do it just everywhere. Um, so I'll talk about what I end up doing, but um, unfortunately I can't do polls and there are a lot of places where you can. not So if you can do polls, we do recommend them. Um, and then post mounted boxes. Now in my, in my particular case, I'm, I, I really can only put nest boxes on pole on posts. So this is a, a, an actual post from my trail. Um, and installation for uh, mounting them on posts is very easy. It just takes like three screws 
using a battery operated drill driver and you're able to, uh, to just screw it right into the post. Um, it's easy to put in and it's easy to remove and it's easy to move somewhere else. Um, and then uh, the pros, well, it may be your only option. And again, I said, it's as fast as easy, easy to install and move. That, that's pretty much it. The cons, they're very vulnerable to predators. Unfortunately, it's very easy for a snake to, to crawl up a post and get up to it. And uh, so um, you have to make sure uh, that you use uh, you know, predator guards like the uh, uh, a knoll guard you can use on post mounted boxes or a wood guard as uh, all of these boxes have. And then you can put them on trees. Now, uh, the installation process is pretty much like the post mounted box. You just drill them into the trees. Um, now, uh, or in some cases you can actually use a, a wire that you can put around, but you have to be careful with that because you don't want to girdle a tree or anything like that. Um, and uh, the, you, you may, now the problem is that, uh, the, as far as the, po the pro, it may be the only option. For example, golf courses uh, are, they love having nest boxes on their property, but they don't like having poles and they don't like having, uh, they don't have posts. So um, you can either do a hanging nest box or you can just mount them on the trees like this. Um, now, it turns out that there, there really isn't that many snakes around golf courses. And so, um, they actually have pretty good luck on golf courses with just mounting these things on trees. But, um, and, and so they're easy to install and move just like the post mounted ones are. Um, they may be your only option, as I said, but the problem is that uh, if you're an experienced nest box monitor, many of them will look at, are talking about trees and just they, their jaw drops because they consider them so unsafe that, um, they just don't even want anybody to be even told about the idea. There are some species that prefer them being on the nest spot on, on the tree. Um, and uh, so if, if this is really your only option, you know, um, just pay attention to what's going on. Make sure and do that weekly check so that you know that um, the, the, uh, you aren't getting just predated left and right. And then let's talk about hanging nest boxes. So this is the fourth version of mounting your nest box. Um, and uh, as you can see, the box is actually hung around a branch of a tree. Now, um, this box is actually being, she's using a hook style retriever. Um, this is a video depicting actually removing a nest box from the tree. Um, this is using a basket style retriever and uh, there's actually a chickadee nest in this box. So you're going to get to see some chickadee. And I'm hoping that you're, uh, uh, that once you see this, it's a little inspiration. So uh, you can see the soft nest that chickadees make. And there are the chickadees. So um, the pros of hanging a nest box is quite a few of them. They're not as vulnerable to predators in California, as I said. In Louisiana, they, they, they can't even believe we use them in California. Their nest boxes are just considered popcorn feeders for the snakes in uh, Louisiana because their, their tree climbing snakes are horrible. But around here, our big snake, the one that always seems to be the problem is the gopher snake. And the gopher snakes, yes, they can climb trees. I've got pictures of them climbing trees, but they don't climb trees all that often. Um, and they are usually not a problem to these nests, these uh, nest boxes. Now, the problem is that if you find a nest, a, a snake in the nest, then uh, you need to move that nest box because they get educated. Um, oh, and then they're excellent for many different species, including bluebirds, because they go underneath the canopy, which is where a lot of the birds like their nest boxes. And as global climate change worsens, cooling effects of the canopy is going to help keep the nests cool. And it also keeps nests away from vandals. And what I mean by that is, let's say, uh, I actually have all of my hanging nest boxes in a picnic area, away from 
the uh, away from the, the tables. But the, the thing is that you can imagine that a picnic area is a place where kids have idle hands and they are running around playing. And when they come across a nest box, um, bad things can happen. So if they see it up in the tree, they usually are going to leave it alone. But if it's down at their level, they very well may pester it and harass it. And the bird is not going to be able to go in and feed her young. Therefore, um, it is actually good to have better to have a nest box up in the tree. Um, and so that, that's a big advantage of hanging nest boxes. So here's two retrievers, two different kinds of retrievers. You see the, the basket, that, that's my basket uh, style. And then underneath, unfortunately, practically hidden by my basket, and I can't believe I did this with this picture, um, is the hook style uh, retriever. So the hook style retriever is actually uh, one that, that is kind of getting more favor because they're easy to build. All you need is the swimming pool pole and that hook, which is uh, readily available at a hardware store. So you can easily make them. And then uh, you go and then, you, you know, just carry them around. Um, so uh, if you're going to do that, I recommend not putting the boxes all that high up. So at McClellan Ranch, they use this, this hook style retriever and they have all of their, their uh, boxes up at around 10 feet, um, 10 to 12 feet. They're high enough. They're not going to get, uh, uh, they're not going to get too much bothered with, um, they have really good clientele there. The, the people there are really good. Even the kids seem to behave themselves. Um, and uh, the, But the thing is that when you actually lift the box off, um, that weight hangs off kind of awkwardly. And um, so one of the cons is that you need to have upper body strength in order to use a nest box retriever. And if you've got that box hanging off the end of the pole, it wants to drag itself down. Whereas if you have it in the box, there's just something a little bit easier about the way it sits in the box. It, it isn't quite as awkward to pull down. And uh, if you have any questions about that, you can uh, let me know. And um, if you're anywhere near, near Cupertino, you can go try their nest box retriever and see what the hook, how the hook one feels. And uh, I, I don't have any problem with trying to find a, a, a basket style that you can compare it to. Um, the, let's see. Um, so you have to have a retriever in order to have a hanging nest box. Um, so this is the hook style retriever in operation. Um, if you, it's, it's hard to see that hook, but it's up there. Um, and then why keep data? So, you can't remember everything that happens. Learn and study what you find. Um, keep notes week by week, the notes of what neat repairs are needed, number of eggs, presence of hatchlings, bird species. This will assist you with knowing where in the nesting cycle each nest box is. Oh, and then uh, forms are available online. You can just, you know, or you can just keep the good notes. Um, citizen science, that's what we're talking about here. And you can download, this is a Nest Watch from Cornell Labs. And you can download this app. It will help you with GPS locations of your boxes. It will, uh, uh, they, they actually like weekly reporting. So what the idea is you would go and you'd actually report as you're along the trail. Um, you report weekly. Uh, they give you nest and egg ID help. They have nest box plans and tips. So um, we do recommend giving your data to Cornell's Nest Watch, um, especially if you're good with the idea of giving it every week. Now, another citizen science thing is our reporting. California Bluebird Recovery Program also wants your data, okay? Um, and we don't have weekly reporting, we ask for annual reporting. Um, the number of nests, eggs, hatchlings, and fledglings of each species. That's what we ask for. We uh, maintain an email list and we'll notify you of data entry information, uh, such as, you know, deadlines, how to do it, um, and uh, events that we may have coming up. Um, so why would you give your data to the California Blueberry Recovery Program? Well, 
Your data tells us how effective our program is and where more attention could be given. It's our best tool to, notif to know which nest box trails are active and which might need new monitors. The data can be used to spot troubling trends in cavity nesting bird populations, especially in California. I've mentioned our nest box monitor, Lee Pauser, several times, and he was actually talking to the people at Cornell. Using our data, he was able to show that tree swallows in California were struggling this last season. That is something that not even Cornell was aware of. Late season rains, winds, climate change can all affect bluebirds and other cavity nesting bird populations, and bluebirds are an indicator species. These can all be studied through our data. As global warming gets worse, we can learn what works and what doesn't by studying our data. We have data over counties all over the state and even down to trails within each county. So um, it's quite useful. And uh, challenges. So let's talk about uh, challenges. Uh, as you can see, there's this uh, gopher snake. Remember I mentioned gopher snakes? Well, that's a gopher snake. A gopher snake in, uh, in a box. Um, unfortunately, now, now here you actually open it and there's a snake. But a lot of times what you find is that, an empty nest. So uh, the snake comes along, he eats and he leaves. Um, and uh, he just leaves you nothing. So you, the only real way to know that he was even there is if you're checking every week. And by checking every week, you can see that, oh, you know what, there ought to be, there should be eggs here. There should be young here. You know, something's wrong. So you know that, an, uh, 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 that a, uh, a snake attacked. So um, as I mentioned before, sometimes, and this is unfortunately goes for all of these different predation things, um, your best tool is to move the nest box so it doesn't get hit again. And, and like I said, I don't blame the snakes. Um, they're just trying to eat, right? Um, in another life, I might be trying to save the snakes, but I'm not trying to feed the snakes at this point. I'm simply trying to help the bluebirds um, with a problem that we set them up with. So for that reason, um, we want to, uh, you know, what your best bet is to try and, oh, but by the way, uh, the Knoll Guard and the Stovepipe Baffle are probably your best weapons against snakes and that not only really works with a pole mounted nest box. Um, the, if you have uh, a, either a tree or a post mounted nest box, you can use Knoll Guards or Wood Guards. Um, and then uh, raccoons. Now, raccoons are strong and they can rip the, the roof right off of the nest box. So you want to keep those nest boxes really sturdy. And uh, we've got videos of nest boxes where a little hand reaches in and grabs a nestling and pulls it out. If they're, um, sometimes what you'll find is uh, the, if, if they were just reaching in and pulling them out through the door, you'll find all of the, uh, the material, the nesti nesting material is just kind of pulled up like this as if uh, something had grabbed it and yanked it towards the door. Um, they grab a little bit of straw when they grab the baby. So um, that's a, a, a raccoon and the knoll guards do help to discourage raccoons if they haven't actually ripped the, 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 the roof right off the, the, uh, the box. Um, and uh, again, they get educated. The raccoons get educated. If they hit you once, they're going to hit you again. And often they, get, they hit more than one box in a night. We've had entire trails decimated by raccoons. And unfortunately, hanging nest boxes are not safe. Um, I had two hanging nest boxes that were attacked. The roofs ripped right off and they were just dropped to the ground. Harold Ratzenberger, our old San Mateo County uh, nest box coordinator, actually watched a raccoon lift a hanging nest box off the branch, drop it to the ground, go down and eat what was inside. Um, and then wasps. Now wasps, this is a European paper wasps. They are mainly a problem in hot boxes, the ones that are out in the hot sun. And um, they could be, the, a lot of times you open them up in the spring and you've got wasps in them. If you've got these wasps, there are a couple things you can do. One is, um, put soap, like take a, so a bar of soap and rub it along the ceiling. 
that makes it hard for them to stick their little comb onto the ceiling. Um, and another one is uh, to uh, what I did when I had a problem is that literally I open up the box and there's like hundreds of these wasps in there. Um, they're generally pretty docile, but they're also very intimidating. And so what I did was I left the box open and I let the, swall the tree swallows, they literally came down and started cleaning them out. Um, so uh, that's one way you can deal with them is just let the, let the birds deal with it, right? Um, the birds may not want to go into an enclosed box with them, but they have no problem flying into an open, the open uh, side, the open wall that you've left open for them. Um, don't use poisons. Um, and uh, what you can do is when it's cool, wear gloves and sweep the combs out of the box. Uh, but that's when there's nothing in there. So um, anyway, uh, was European paper wasps. And then, um, oh, I, I, another one is in the, you want to have good ventilation. If you have good ventilation right along the top of the nest box, then, uh, then that will also discourage them. They don't like a lot of move, air movement in there. Um, and then bumblebees. Now, this is actually a problem I hope you have. And the reason is because bumblebees are pollinators and native bees. And we need more native bees. If they're in your nest box, that means they don't have anywhere else to go. So I hope you will give, cut them a break, uh, give them that nest box, and you can put up another nest box for the birds. Um, and so the, they, they like these soft nests. They like chick, old chickadee nests. Um, and so, uh, what, like I said, I recommend just giving them the nest box for the season. Um, if you have them one year, but they, they'll move out um, eventually. Um, now, uh, I think Georgette was saying that, that they're, it's kind of rare, but if you have them moving into your nest box, you're probably going to have it happen on a fairly regular basis. And, um, but again, it's not a problem. I, if, if it happens often enough, then it's sometimes good just to go ahead and plan on it and put up a nest box that you expect them to take. Um, and uh, they like they lock soft material. Uh, Doug Ptolemy actually suggests using a toilet paper roll. So I'm trying to experiment by putting a toilet paper roll in there to see if they'll make a nest out of the toilet paper roll material because it's nice and soft. Um, honeybees. So honeybees are uh, sometimes a problem. They're not often a problem. It's one of those things when they swarm. Um, if they're a problem, that may only be a problem for like a week. Um, and if they persist, you can call in a bee man or something like that. Don't open the, the nest box, you know, just leave because you don't want to be attacked or anything like that. Um, let the, the bee guy handle it. Ants, especially fire ants. I, I pretty much already went through the, uh, the diatomaceous earth and the tangle foot and the tangle trap and stuff like that. So I'm just going to go ahead and leave that, that there. Um, and then blowflies and parasites. Now, the best way to deal with these is to remove the nest every time you see an empty nest. When um, you go there every week and you'll see the cycle and some, at some point they're all gonna fledge and they're gonna leave this old poopy nest behind. You wanna pull that nest out. Um, I mentioned the double nest, we don't wanna do that. You wanna have a nice clean box for them to go in and set up a new nest. And they may do that within a week of being done with their previous nest. So um, as soon as you see that nest empty, get it out of there. Um, if you do have blowflies, this is supposed to be a way, uh, uh, something that, that, um, that protects against them. Um, it's, it's just a, a little screen that you put down at the bottom there. Uh, and then corvids and hawks. Now, corvids, which is the, the jays, like this uh, scrub jay, or um, mockingbirds, things like that, they uh, can actually try and attack the nest box directly and stick their head in the door. Um, that's why the uh, knoll guard, the wood guard um, will uh, be good against, to battle against that. Um, and uh, then the, the hawks, they don't, they don't tend to go and try and get into the box like that. What they do is they sit there and wait for the babies to fledge. So that's why it's important that you um, set up, you know, set up the box so it's near a tree or something that they can fly to. Um, because, uh, yeah, it's just not, it's kind of sad. 
Um, and then house sparrows and starlings. Now I'm not going to go too much into detail because we have a really good um, amount of information on our website for this. Lee Pouser put together um, a bunch of different uh, suggestions that he has for house sparrow problems. And you can also look it up on Cialis.org that we'll talk about at the end. Um, and then house wrens. So um, house wrens are a problem. They are a native bird. So they're not like house sparrows. House sparrows you can go and take their nests out. You can kill the you can kill the adults. You can kill the babies. You can kill the eggs. Obviously, nobody really wants to do that. But you can get rid of the eggs, right? That that's fairly easy. Just stop them from developing. Um, and uh, so, but house wrens that's a different story because they're native. They they have every right to be here. And this is the kind of nest nest that they put up. They put them up making out of a uh, out of sticks. Okay. And they actually make dummy nests because they don't want any other bird nesting anywhere near them. So they will find every cavity. And if they're not nesting in that cavity, they'll fill it up with sticks, um, which is, they, they all kind of look like dummy nests, but I, I pull, I'm like, oh, there's a dummy nest. I start pulling it out. Oh, no, it's not a dummy nest. There's actually a cup in there with, uh, with eggs. So um, they, uh, they're very tall. Uh, nests and they're very small birds so they will actually make it so that it looks like you can't get in there but they're such small birds they can like make their way between the twigs in order to get to their nest um so the problem is that they will kill uh they will uh break eggs and uh may even attack um bluebird uh young so uh that's why they're a problem they nest near thickets. If you think you have um, a nest box in uh, house wren habitat, then try and keep the other boxes away from their habitat and use a smaller nest, a smaller entrance hole for them so that other birds won't go in there. So hopefully you make the house wrens happy over there and you keep the bluebirds safe somewhere else. Um, and again, if you have any more, qu any more questions, let us know. Um, woodpeckers. Now, the, the biggest, as you can see, uh, this is actually the Pouser's picture, but I have one very similar uh, because Nuttles woodpeckers also nested in my nest boxes. Um, I think they're really cool, and I have no problem at all having a nest box, uh, having a woodpecker in my nest box. But they tend to open up the nest box, and I actually have a video about this later on. Um, actually, this is it. This is the. This is. Tex Houston, the old Santa Clara County coordinator. Oh, hey, um, can everybody hear that, by the way? Let me, let me pull it out just to make sure. No, I didn't hear anything, Mike. I didn't hear anything. Let me, let me uh, back up and try this again. How about now? Yes. Okay. Let's see, it modified this box. So it just happens that I work in a violin shop. But I can put a thin piece of one of these on. And this, this would be the right hole here. This is a bluebird size, and this is a chickadee box. Why do you need to put that piece? Well, see how the woodpeckers have picked that hole? Yeah. See how it's, the hole's not the right size yeah. anymore. Oh, it's only mean, supposed to be an inch and a quarter on these boxes. And that's definitely not an inch and a quarter. That's more like an inch and a half. And so I have these protectors of different sizes here. Yeah, there's a small one. So this is one I have. So first we'll drill a couple of holes. I don't have to worry about drilling a hole into this because it's soft. This hardwood, there's no way to get us getting a screw to that. Would be I know I'm not because then it's easier for the the predators and it's just not the right size and also um, so uh, that's why we do this so a couple of things you mentioned that he works in a violin shop and the reason that was important was because he actually gets uh, he, he gets you know this this uh, old this this wood that is no longer they're not no longer able to use it. He's able to recycle it by using it to reshape it into these uh, these protectors these plate protectors. 
but um, uh, hopefully you saw that I had, I mentioned, I showed you some metal protectors that are basically the same thing that you would put over the nest box. That's what, that's the one way of preventing the woodpecker damage altogether, or you can take uh, just wood and, um, and use it. Now he's got this, this wood apparently is very, very tough and uh, it's not easy for the woodpeckers to, to go into. But what I would like to do is just um, use a kind of wood that the woodpeckers can drill into, but I just go ahead and close it up because they usually do their damage in the winter. And, um, and so by uh, closing up the, uh, the box um, for the, the nesting season, you're able to um, make it so that only the bird you want in the nest box is able to go into the nest box. Um, so anyway, uh, mice, rats, and squirrels. So squirrels don't usually get into the nest boxes, at least not these nest boxes, unless something is wrong with the entrance hole. For example, the woodpeckers open it up. But um, if you keep that entrance hole to the correct size, you still may have native rats and native mice. And when I say native, that ought to tell you what my attitude generally is towards them. Um, which is a lot more charitable than some people. Um, but the thing is that they are the bottom of the food chain and they're important to have around. And they wouldn't be in the nest box if they felt that there was anywhere else to go. So for the same reason that I don't have, uh, that I'm trying to help the, the bluebirds, if I've got bumblebees or I've got uh, native, native bees, if I've got native rats, if I've got native mice, I tend to try and uh, leave them there, right? Um, they, uh, now, the, the, there is a, Lee Pauser actually has a device he's developed that uh, is supposed to prevent the mice and rats from getting into your nest box. And so you can actually have some of your nest boxes with his device on it and others you, you can figure, well, if the, if the mice want to get in there so bad, they can use that one over there. And, and you know, chances are, they're just feeding the hawks anyway. Um, but the, uh, um, but the, uh, anyway, uh, let's see uh, how, so, so that's one way to deal with it. I'm not sure if we have that information on our website, but I'll try and find, I'll try and find it and, and get it there. Um, so obviously if you find like uh, this little mat of material right there, don't stick your finger in there. Um, you can stick your, screwdriver in and kind of dig around and see if they're in there. And, and uh, as you can see, um, he certainly was this time. Um, and then uh, challenges. This is my, my old cat from a long time ago, trying to prove why I can't have clean clothing. Um, and cats are a challenge because obviously if, um, you know, they can, they can land up on top of the nest box and reach in and grab the nestlings out. So you wanna, if you know you have cats around and this could be your cat, it could be a neighborhood cat, it could be feral cats. Um, you want to have a good long overhang. You wanna have that nest box away from any fence, fences or posts or anything that the cat can jump over from in order to land on top. And, and if it's bad enough, you can even put little spikes or something like that up on top of the nest box to prevent them from sitting on top of the nest box. Um, and then you can um, uh, put a, a null guard on because uh, the cats also um, have a problem with that. And then bats. Now, this is another problem that I hope you have because bats are important to us. And uh, so what uh, if, it's, if you have bats in your nest box, what it tells you is you need to put up a bat house nearby because bat houses will um, give them a better place to go than inside your nest box. But um, what often happens is these, these bats are just as desperate for a place to hang out in the, during the day as, uh, as the birds are. So I implore you, if you find a bat like this in your box, close that box back up and leave it for the bat. They're probably gonna be gone by the next day, but if they're not, um, just you know leave, leave the bat the box for the time being, um, maybe give uh, and, and put up a, a bat box um, in a tree or something like that nearby. Um, 
And I, I should mention because you know bats can have rabies. Chances are the bat you find your nest box here doesn't, but don't take any chances. Don't touch them. You haven't been trained in touching them, and therefore don't touch them. Just leave them be, and um, and be glad that we have bats to take care of the mosquitoes in the in wherever it is your nest box is. Um, soiled nests, you can uh, actually. Um, I, I talked about the plastic container that you can keep straw in or something like that to replace, uh, to use to build a, a new nest if you need to. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, heat and cold, food source crashes, death of a parent, this is why you may end up finding dead babies in your nest. Uh, um, and um, that there are different clues into it. I'm not going to get too much into it. I think it looks like we're already over time. So cleaning and repairing this there isn't much left here um so this is a box that is being used it's a box being used for roosting roosting is something the birds do in the uh uh that the birds do in the winter and they're just huddling up for warmth they use your nest boxes to uh to try and stay warm. So anyway, um, you can use a 10% bleach solution to spray your box on the inside and let dry thoroughly, but I would only do it once a year. And, um, and you can do it basically at the end of the season to, uh, so that it, it's ready for, uh, for the winter. And then uh, you check you're, and again, but basically at the end of the season, check the uh, integrity of the roof and the water tightness and things like that and repair any woodpecker damage. So um, California Bloom Recovery Program, Georgette, are you there? Oh, Georgette. Um, so we have a number of, uh, I, hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, so I haven't heard anybody. So, um, the, uh, we have a number of resources for you. Um, our California Bluebird Recovery Program uh, website, there she is. Um, our California Bluebird Recovery Program website um, has a section called Getting Started. And we have an awful lot of information there. Basically, we've got kind of a written version of our training uh, there. You wanna take over? Oh yes, thanks, Mike. Um, okay, well, um... First of all, that was a lot of information to cover in two hours. And we hope you've learned key tips on what monitoring is, how to set up a trail, keep data and monitor. Um, it's so much information and it's, we have so many details that we couldn't get into. For instance, when Mike uh, mentioned uh, that, we need, that you, you need an acre for your backyard boxes, what he was referring to is that um, in your neighborhood, if there are grassy areas, maybe a schoolyard, maybe or maybe a small orchard or gardens, you may well be able, your birds may well be able to find enough food, um, especially if you've been seeing bluebirds or chickadees or titmice in your neighborhood, there's a very good chance that they are finding food um, so, or insects. So, um, many small backyards are actually very successful um, habitats for nest boxes. I have a, a friend that I coached some years back who lives in El Cerrito, and she has a nest box under an eave, and she lives in a very dense uh, urban area. But next door to her, there's there's a uh, habitat in her friend's yard. There's uh, a garden with many fruit trees just next to that. And then they have open space in the hill. So, so, and she's, her box produces, has produced six broods in three years. Um, so don't let that discourage you. You know, it's just a matter of looking in your neighborhood and seeing uh, what's available um, for habitat uh, beyond your yard. And then also, you know, it can't, we don't want you to be discouraged by, you know, all the challenges that, that we've presented to you. We just want you to be able to diagnose and handle issues if they do come up. 
we i have never had i've been i've been a nest box monitor for 24 years i have never had a snake in my box um i have had very few wasps in my boxes and um i've had very few of those challenges actually so uh we just want you to be prepared it's not a matter of warning you that these things are going to come up a lot because they actually don't and you got um, old guards on pretty much all of your boxes though too right yes i have no guards and 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 if you do have a problem we had a question uh you know about um uh would you remove a nest if all your all, uh, if all your nestlings were predated and I said well it depends it depends on you know you've, you've got to figure out what happened if it was a raccoon if it was if it was a snake um if it was ants I mean it's just it's just you have to figure that part out but um if the nest is clean and uh you know you've figured it out I'd leave the nest in there and hope that you know the parents could start again because they often do. The parents, but a lot of times the parents will just go ahead and build a new nest, unfortunately. Right. So, um, I, that my, too. My, my, my advice would actually be to go ahead and remove the nest and let them start. Remove the nest. Okay. They, well, they okay. actually are amazingly fast at building new nests. <laughs> okay. Well, Mike's advice is to remove the nest. Okay. Um, so. The so we're we, at loggerheads. No, no, it's all right. I'm just, I'm just so, um, so, uh, we have some resources for you. Mike uh, mentioned um, our website and we have a lot of information there that covered the entire course in detail under getting started. Um, and on the, uh, in that, uh, on our website also under resources is a wonderful booklet. And um, it's written by, it's called Monitoring Your Bluebird Trail in California by Hatch Graham. And he has sections in there that we did not cover. So that's a, a wonderful resource in it. He actually, I think, started writing it in 1992. Um, so it goes way back. And he was good friends with Don Yoder, who was the founder of the program. And then um, the other book that I really like a lot, and I used a lot when I first got started, was the Bluebird Monitor's Guide. And that's mostly geared for Eastern bluebirds, but it's very relevant, has a beautiful pictorial in there on daily development of Eastern bluebird nestlings from hatch to fledge. And it's a practical guide. And then um, uh, the bluebird book by the Stokes, I think is valuable also. Uh, it has a lot of general information, mostly geared toward Eastern bluebirds, but is still relevant. And what I like about that book, it talks a lot about behavior. And that's, those are, that's information that you don't get necessarily in, in the guides and that, but, but they talk a lot about behavior. And then um, Cialis, um, Mike already mentioned that. That's a comprehensive uh, website that has the most information about bluebirds on there. So if you have specific, uh, you know, questions in that, you can you can certainly refer to that. And then the North American Bluebird Society. Now we are an affiliate of the North American Bluebird Society. I think there's about 125 of us throughout uh, the United States, and uh, they have fact sheets that are really good to look at and to read. Um, I highly recommend them. I, I usually print those out for new monitors and give them to them. Um, for um, uh, the uh, mountain bluebird, Myrna Perman is the expert. And she has a wonderful, wonderful book called Mountain Bluebird Trail Monitoring Guide. Um, and it was published in 2002, um, and she's a retired biologist at Ellis Bird Farm in Alberta, Canada, and she's known by many bluebirds as the mountain bluebird expert, and she just published a new book, which I highly recommend, and it is free. You can go on to the North American Bluebird Society website and uh, print it out, and it's a wonderful resource well, actually, it's wonderful for us. I'm going to read through it for myself again because you always pick up tips um, from other from other people. 
uh, like Mirna, who's been a monitor for many, many years, because we never learn at all. I mean, there's always something that we're going to learn and, and people have different opinions, you know? So, uh, you know, it's just valuable. I'll be using this book for my Eagle Scouts. I, I work with Tom Gary, my monitor partner, and I work with Eagle Scouts uh, frequently and I'll be using this book for them. And then the last two books that I wanna recommend is, uh, are the books by Doug Ptolemy. Now, Doug Ptolemy, um, Bringing Back the Natives, he is an entomologist professor and he sparked a national conversation. Uh, there is an unbreakable link between native plant species and native wildlife. And he really emphasizes that when native plants disappear, so do insects. And his books may well influence you greatly, um, you know, in terms of your visions about landscape, common spaces, and your own backyards. So um, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us. And uh, let's see what we we um, have here. Oh, Francis, Francis says, uh, We've been leaving our boxes open during the winter and the rains clean them out. Yeah, why not? The only thing about that, I think, is I don't see any harm in that. But if you leave them open, then the birds can't roost in them. So that that would be my concern there. Um, and then, uh, oh, OK, so the answer to that was, OK, there you go. And Francis says, I've had bats, snakes, mice, and wasps. Okay, yeah, all right. Yeah, and apparently you've known how to deal with them. So, because you've been a monitor for quite a while. So, hey, all right. Um, you notice, notice in the chat that Beverly Cronin uh, has actually taught, you know, anybody who's from San Mateo County, she's your coordinator and she's offering to, to give you help. So she uh, put some uh, contact information there. She's just, hello, Beverly. Uh, she put her uh, her information into the uh, the chat. Did you put your information in the chat? Yes, she okay. did. So and she I'm, put her information in the chat so you can go ahead and get a hold of her. And I put my personal email in there for Contra Costa County and Alameda counties people. If if you know are there are any of you uh, here, um, you know, please email me directly. I know Karen is going to. Uh, talk about a uh, trail in Martinez. And we have potentially two new trails in Walnut Creek. Um, they haven't been installed yet, but um, they've been mapped out. So, um, so you know, uh, and then Alameda County, we have to go and map out some new trails, but that's a lot of fun. It's exciting. So just let me know. Did and everybody else, everybody else, if you need help, please contact us because that's did what you, we're here. Did you have anything else you wanted to say, Beverly? No. Okay, good. <laughs> Everything is um, wonderful. <laughs> and then, uh, Carolyn uh, actually has a, uh, an offer in there. If anybody wanted to kind of come to Cupertino and check out their nest boxes and, uh, and things like that, she put her contact information in there. And uh, if you have any questions for Santa Clara County, you can, of course, um, use uh, her contact information too, and oh. and she can get a hold of me if uh, if uh, if there's anything. Yeah. And I do have one more comment, please. Um, if you're from Monterey or Santa Cruz, definitely email me because we may have um, tra trails that are already on uh, either wineries or farms that um, are Wild Farm Alliance uh, trails that need monitors. And also Santa Clara, if you are uh, from Santa Clara, do contact Beverly. No, I guess I guess he she would contact Caroline she, because yeah. because Beverly uh, is Cimitale. Cimitale. Yeah. But uh, but uh, Carolyn may have some abandoned trails in Santa Clara that she could hook you up with. Right. Okay. okay. Well, that's well it. thank you very much. And uh, so I guess uh, Carolyn, we're about ready to. And this will be recorded? This yes. is recorded. Yes. Yeah. Wait. All right. So um, I guess we're, we're, we're done. So thank you very much for coming, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Francis. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.